Hi, I'm Ross, and this week we're in Matthew 20. The portion of Matthew we studied this week has numerous vignettes in it. In discussion, you guys dove into each one, learning what God had for you in each. I don't have time to discuss it in the detail that you already have. What I hope to do is take a step back and see how these things might be related to each other, result from what went before, or point to what's to come. For example, what motivated the vineyard worker parable? And what was it trying to address? But uh, let's pray um, before we start here. Father in heaven, your word is simple enough for a young child to understand and deeper than the wisest could plumb in a lifetime. But it's today, and we need you to speak to us today. So I pray that during this talk, we hear from you, and it helps us to make a God-pleasing choice in the coming days. Thank you for your word. It's living and active, discerning the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. We pray in Jesus' name. <clears throat> now, this lecture is well-suited to having your Bibles open and following along, and I'll occasionally make a chapter and verse reference to keep us, uh, you know, show us where we are. Let's let me start by reminding us of the parable of the vineyard workers. I'm told that in certain parts of the country, day labor is still a thing. Contractors hire day laborers right out of the Home Depot parking lot early in the morning. And we see the vineyard owner doing the same thing at 6 a.m. He hires every willing worker and agrees for the going rate for a day's work. But surprise, he's back at the Home Depot parking lot at 9 a.m. Three hours later, sees guys doing nothing and tells them to climb in the back of the pickup and work for him. He'll pay them fairly. Well, at least it's still the morning. He returns at noon and then at three for the same deal. <clears throat> but get this, he shows up at 5 p.m., almost dusk, and hires more. Notice this, the landowner asks the 5 p.m. guys why they're standing around doing nothing. They tell him, huh, because no one's hired us. Now, the landowner knows this to be a pants-on-fire lie because it's his fifth visit to the Home Depot parking lot that day, and he's hired every willing worker each trip. But he hires these liars anyways. Of course, we know how the story ends up. At 6 p.m., the sun's near setting and the workers are getting lined up to be paid in the reverse order of hiring time. The work shirkers who showed up late get paid first, and they had no intention of getting hired, but somehow they got roped into showing up and getting a full day's wage for it. And so the payout went right up until it got to the responsible guys who were there on time to be hired at sunup at 6 a.m. Those guys decide to grumble. The landowner sends them packing, but not before pointing out their defective thinking. You guys got what you agreed to. Could it be that envy is stealing your joy? My son loves to quote this. Comparison is the thief of joy. That's a practical lesson for all humanity, Christian or not. <clears throat> but in hearing that lesson, Let's not miss what God's revealing of his nature. He's over-the-top generous, as in prodigiously generous, as in prodigal generous, with work shirking liars. And personally, I find this really good news that guys like me, for guys like me, who weren't in that Home Depot parking lot at 6 a.m., ready to work for the landowner. I've often heard the parable interpreted this way. You responsible, longtime church folk, just keep up your joyless service as the Johnny Come Latelys are jumping around screaming like they just got called down for the price is right. But why are the newbies so jazzed? Because God was generous with them. When we realize God's generosity, all of a sudden we stop keeping store and everyone is going nuts with joy. Joy marks those who get God's generosity. If you're not feeling it, either you're not getting the depth of your depravity 
or you're not getting the height of God's holiness, or probably both. When told a Bible story or parable, it's natural to imagine ourselves in the story. One commentator supposes that the reader is supposed to take the place of the second unnamed character, maybe like demoniac number two or blind guy number two. When I read the vineyard parable, I first tried to put myself in the place of the responsible guys who started at 6 a.m. But after thinking about it for a while, I decided that I fit better with the 5 p.m. guys. In fact, the landowner had to hit the horn twice to coax me into the back of the pickup as he was starting to leave for the vineyard. I barely broke a sweat and got 12 hours of pay. I'm happy for myself, and the landowner is tops in my book. Just before the vineyard worker parable was Jesus' conversation with the rich young ruler, where Jesus called that rich young ruler to give it all away and follow him. Disciples ask, well, who then can be saved? And then a little bit later, Peter asks, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Jesus mentions rewards that happen to include sitting on 12 thrones. Now, let's try to make a connection. Just before the parable, the disciples could be well be thinking, okay, I'm in that left everything to follow category. My rewards are named and they're more impressive than I could imagine. But what about those other more recent followers who joined? What do they get? Like a chorus, this parable is bracketed by similar phrases that sound something like this. So the first will be last, and the, excuse me, pardon me, and the last will be first, and the first will be last. After feeling the sting of that corrective parable from Jesus, I, knew, I now hear that chorus differently. I'm now thinking that first or last is not my concern. I'm just grateful for God's generosity. Truth be told, I need to concern myself with just getting in the door, not about my place in line. This is Jesus' last week before the cross. Jesus spells out hu the humility required to be a follower. Remember the children? For the kingdom of heaven belongs such to such as these. The first and the last, and now this parable, on the Thursday of this last, excuse me, on Thursday of this last week before the cross, Jesus will show us the full extent of his love with foot washing. Pride is a clear and present danger. We are warned and directed to be to anti-pride, and that anti-pride is to become a servant. In previous chapters, the message was to become like a child. Is there a person or class of persons that trigger in you feelings of superiority? Are they less deserving of God's generosity than you? If you want to remain in your pride, steer clear of the book of Matthew. Again and again, the pride of life breaks through in the characters. Now, we've come to expect pride in the religious leaders, but we see the disciples are not immune from it either. The Gospels include both the teaching and the childish performance that prompted that teaching. Now, let's move to the next section, starting in Matthew 20, verse 17. In the text, the day is what's become known as Palm Sunday, which is the Sunday before the Friday of Jesus' death. To the Jews, that Sunday was Lamb Selection Day, and it's prescribed in the book of Exodus. It was the day that the Jews would choose their Passover lamb to be killed in their stead. Jesus knows what would happen this week, what, what this week holds. And in verse 17, Jesus again tells the disciples what will happen on this trip to Jerusalem. Betrayal, condemned, mocked, flogged, crucified, and raised. This was a restatement 
of what Jesus had said in Matthew 17, 22. The disciples' response to this hard message didn't seem to mature from the Matthew 18 incident. Remember the prideful, who's the greatest argument shortly after the transfiguration? Well, apparently the disciples didn't remember it. What they must have remembered instead is the mention of those 12 thrones in 1928. Starting in verse 20, Zebedee's sons are asking for the good seats. And just to make it intensely embarrassing, they get their mother involved. Luke 18.34 helps us understand this shameful behavior. It says, the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what they're talking about. <clears throat> I feel like I have the same sad condition. I can hold ideas like praise and blessing and heaven in my head, but ideas like service, suffering, persecution don't have much staying power in my consciousness. While the disciples want to talk about rewards, Jesus asked them if they could drink the cup he was going to drink. They say, we can. Jesus corrects them by saying, you will. I take this to mean not then, not easily, but eventually. So this is the usual ditch that Ross finds himself in. I simply filter out Jesus' words about following to the cross. I become presumptuous, which is not a good look. But there's another ditch where I end up, thankfully not often. I equate the difficult path Jesus describes <clears throat> to consistently choosing misery until you die, at which time the eternal church service begins. Now, that's a double lie. First, I devalue the reward of an eternity spent with the person who loves me with an infinite love, where I'm free from the effects of sin. Second, I suppose that pleasing my Father in heaven, here on earth, is joyless. The truth is, is that a life of service is both difficult and rewarding. But this is not some concept you need to be a Christian to get. People get this. People observe that dude chose a difficult lifestyle, but look at his reward. Not a reward defined by worldly pleasures or adoration of men, but in a life well spent. The movies I, I chose to watch with my boys had the theme of a life well spent. You could think of books and movies of someone who gave their lives for another. And those books challenge you. But you have met these guys. They pop up in your discussion groups. In literature, this is called nobility, where you never serve yourself and you never touch God's glory. In Matthew 20, Jesus said this, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. I can ignore this call to service by blocking it from my consciousness. I can allow the devil's lies to paint it such that it doesn't seem good to me. Or I can choose life, following Jesus in his example of service for the joy set before him. Let's make it our joy to anticipate hearing, well done, good and faithful servant. It might not feel great to serve, but Jesus says you will be great when you serve. Everything that serving Christ demands is more than worth it. You cannot outgive God. The principle is whoever wants to become great must be a servant. Whoever wants to become great must be a servant. <clears throat> Guys, at this point in the talk, I'm supposed to come up with some questions that get you to think about the application in your life. You are off the hook this time. Instead, let me pick on a guy I know. This guy has been married for nearly four decades, but our friends suggested that they read a book together. And in reading that book, along with some prompting, he realized that he could seemingly extend grace to most folks, except his wife. Then he saw why. 
he was approaching marriage like a transaction. You do this, I'll do that. This is a form of the pride of pride that derailed the disciples when their, eye, when their eyes were on the deal their buddies might get. Think about the way Jesus approached his marriage to his bride, the church. He showed up not to serve, not to be served, excuse me, but to serve. And that's what a godly husband loves like. This guy now sees that marriage is a commitment to minister to his wife with no guarantee of the results. So for me, when I read, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, names pop into the character slots like this. If Ross wishes to be great, then he must be he must be committed to minister to Judy. I warned you guys to steer clear of Matthew. Names can pop into the stories and parables in the commands. So far, we've explored a servant's work. Now, let's observe their worship. I'm pretty amazed that the disciples readily record their stumbling around, not getting it. In the next vignette, we have irony coming up because we have the two blind guys that can that see clearly what the others only have a fuzzy notion of. This is a super fun story. Let's enjoy it together. Beginning in verse 29. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed them. Now remember, they're on their way to Jerusalem for the showdown. Jesus told the disciples exactly what was going to happen. But the scary stuff might be hard for his disciples to remember. Because right now, Jesus has an adoring crowd following him. Verse 30, two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. So cool. These guys called Jesus Lord, meaning that Jesus was the boss, as in the boss of bosses. And they called him son of David because they knew him to be the promised king who would reign forever. And they asked for mercy because they knew Jesus to be the merciful healer. By the way, from elsewhere, we learned the blind guy is Bartimaeus and the other is, unblind, is unnamed blind guy, number two. Verse 31, the crowd rebuked him and told him to be quiet. Because, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Now they were shouting it. This is the king, the son of David, promised long ago. Super important. Now, what was the crowd thinking? Could they be thinking, are these the blind? Excuse me, are, are, is this Jesus guy? Is he actually the king? The promised king? Verse 32 goes, Jesus stopped them and called. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. They asked in faith. They must have had faith to make such a spectacle. Verse 34 says, Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. We find out that Jesus is indeed compassionate. Jesus heals right then. And Jesus still heals and praise God. They follow Jesus. Armed with this story, you are ready to tell anyone the gospel. It starts with recognizing one's need, a cry for mercy, a recognition of Jesus, faith, healing, and ends up with them following Jesus. There'll be plenty of time to fill the details in. Perhaps you might even be led to retell the story, but this time with you as one of the characters. Chapter 21, verse 1, begins the triumphal entry, where more people recognize King Jesus and praise him. And why do the folks recognize him? It's perhaps due to the two blind guys shouting out the truth about who Jesus was, son of David, meaning the long-promised king. Not just a king, but the king who would reign forever. The triumphal entry is a growing crowd of worshipers. And they are worshiping him for the salvation he brings. There are at least two guys in the crowd that are having the best day of their lives now that they see. 
and the first person they see is Jesus, the object of their unrestrained worship. Nobody can be told to worship. Nobody needs to be told to worship. Now, some folks might stand a suggestion to allow their body language to come in line with their hearts. I've seen some pretty spirited reactions to a touchdown, but I've seldom seen that in church. Jesus knows what I geek out on, and he knows what you geek out on. Not only does Jesus know what I geek out on, but my acquaintances do too. The dog walkers know me as the guy with the treehouse in the backyard. The car guys know me as the guy with the old Jeeps. In conversations after church, if people want to strike up a conversation, they ask me about electric cars or my son's solar energy business. And lately, they ask me about my grandchild. Somehow, people easily know what has captured my attention. What a guy worships always seems to be apparent, and it shows up at his funeral. This past Saturday, I attended a funeral for a friend's wife, who I didn't know that well. Sure, she had a weakness for Christmas decorations, but people mainly talked about her prayer for others and her service to others. That's the sort of legacy you want. I've seen guys at a point in their Jesus following convert much of their hobby, their gifting, their business to serving others. I think it's to God's credit when the hobby is the same, but the objective changes to someone else's spiritual health. I know of guys who retired to care for their wives who have medical conditions. When the focus goes from me to them, it changes the atmosphere. It's no longer about me. Now, I intended to talk about worship, but somehow I got back on the service. Maybe there's a link there. Back to the triumphal entry. Following Bartimaeus getting his sight, Jesus stops at the house of figs, a place name will matter in next week's lesson, and sends for the colt of a donkey. I want to be the guy who tosses the keys to the donkey, which is the pickup truck of the day, to the disciples. And then I want to shout after them that the Lord can borrow my pickup anytime. Besides, it ain't my pickup, it's God's pickup. Matthew then reminds us of the prophecy fulfilled. Say to the daughter Zion, that's a name for Jerusalem, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The fact that Jesus is gentle and lowly, breathtaking. They spread out the red carpet of the day for his royal procession, jackets and branches. The shouts command Jerusalem's attention. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When I was a kid, Hosanna sounded like a general whoop of elation. But what it really says is, we are saved. If you need some imagery to imagine what that's like, think back to those World War II newsreels or Hollywood portrayals of European cities being liberated in 1944 and 1945. Upon getting to the temple, Jesus goes on a one-man cleanup of the temple. Out go the buyers and sellers, the money changers and the dove sellers. Following that, healings of the blind and lame. Jesus is still in the business of cleansing and healing. The children, remember them? They count in Jesus' world. They are calling Jesus the promised king, the son of David. The leadership tries to hit the off switch on that, but Jesus uses scripture to tell them how right it is. Worship. These kids instinctively got it. Jesus was worthy of their worship. Word would have got around that Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. If our kids think they count, they're much more likely to join the mission. Let's let them know that they count. <clears throat> Recall what the blind guy shouted. Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. They got mercy. 
Of course, they followed. They weren't going to lose sight of the object of their worship. Let's make that our principle. Mercy's right response is worship. Mercy's right response is worship. Where's the guy who walks his dog past my house every day? See that I worship. Based on the few ruts that my conversations fall into, what do my friends know I worship? Who do you know that had a turn around on what he worshiped? What might happen if you were to ask God to increase your appetite for something that will matter for eternity? Now, I don't see in the Bible where God is seeking an army of servants madly looking for the next service opportunity. In fact, that sounds like the opposite of his burden is light. He is seeking worshipers. Now, he does say the way to greatness is via serving, just as he came not to be served, but to serve. Don't try to impress God with your service. Let your service be an act of worship for the king who heals and brings salvation. In my daydreams, I dream of greatness. But I want Jesus' words to cut through that fog with this message. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. We find ourselves with hobbies, interests, giftings, resources. Obviously, they don't impress God. But God can and perhaps would transform the stuff that's imprinted us, good and bad, to enable us to uniquely, excuse me, <clears throat> to uniquely serve for an eternal purpose to the one who's worthy of our worship. Let's pray. Jesus, Jesus, fill us with your love. Show us how to serve the neighbors we have from you. Lord Jesus, we cry out with the blind, blind, with the blind guys. You are the Lord and healer. We thank you for meeting us where we are and loving us and not leaving us there. Hire us for your work. Bring us to worship. Amen.